this is the Monday Mindset Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 60. And this week, it's Terry's turn to share something that she's found interesting this week. What have you got for us today, Terry? Well, Daisy, this week I've been diving into listening to some things about sleep. Mm -hmm. I know this has been a big topic that's come up a lot over the past few years. A number of kind of prominent books have been written and a lot of TED Talks and things about sleep, but I've never followed many of them very closely. So the other night I started listening to a Rich Roll episode with Matthew Walker, who wrote one of the kind of prominent books about sleep. I have actually listened to that. Ah. <laughs> I can't remember where I was driving to, but it was one of those ones where I listened to the whole book. <laughs> yeah, even just this podcast episode was three hours long. Wow. So I got going into it for a while, but then I hadn't completed that one. And then I started finding some other people that I was interested in. And so I listened to some by another author and psychologist, Dr. Michael Bruce, B-R-E-U-S. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And so I listened to two episodes that I wanted to pull together in today's talk. Um, but really, he highlights the primary points in both. The first is an episode of the Mind Valley podcast with Vishen Lakiani. And it is five steps to take for a better sleep. And then the other episode was a podcast that I'd never listened to before, but I really liked it. And the podcast is called Finding Mastery, Conversations with Michael Gervais. And really just talking, he's talking with people who have found mastery in certain areas and really a, a great interviewer and a very interesting conversation. Their podcast episode was a little over an hour long, but only maybe... 20 minutes or less was about sleep and the rest was about Michael Bruce and his growing up and kind of how he developed and things. It was just a great interview. I would encourage anyone to listen to it. Very motivating. But what I wanted to share are the key points about sleep that he discussed in these two episodes. So the first thing he talked about was the idea that so often you hear when people talk about sleep, they're very focused on how many hours of sleep does everyone need as if there's you know one correct answer and he said that it's not so much about how much sleep but to actually know how much sleep you need and then also to learn more about when you are best to get that sleep so he talks about a system of our chronotype and we'll I'll go into some detail about that in a moment but he broke it down basically that we have two factors in our sleep. One is our sleep drive, our drive to sleep, and that this is caused at least in part by adenosine, which is a byproduct of our body breaking down calories, burning calories. And the adenosine accumulates in our brain and makes us sleepy. The more adenosine, the more sleep the more tired you're going to be. And then there's our sleep rhythm. When to sleep, when to be awake, the timing of hunger and sleep, and this is our circadian rhythm. So if these two factors are in sync, our sleep drive and our sleep rhythm, we're going to get good sleep. All is going to be good. But when one or both are off, this is where we have difficulties and we don't sleep well. We could develop a sleep disorder like insomnia, apnea, narcolepsy, or we could have what is even more common is just disordered sleep, which so many people experience. So Michael Bruce does this categorization that each of us fall into one chronotype of who we are as far as our sleep cycles. And these are lions, bears, wolves, and dolphins. The lions, if you're a lion, generally you're the early bird. You wake up early and you're energized. You're a morning person. First thing, you're bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and ready to face the day. But you get very tired by the evening and you go to sleep early. This is about 15 to 20% of the population. And they tend to be most productive in the early morning. 
So I had a friend who would love to get up at 5 a.m. because she could get several hours of work done before anyone else was even awake. She was very productive that time of day. Then we have the bears. Bears sleep and wake according to the sun. They feel more energetic during the daytime. They have no trouble falling asleep at night, though. And they tend to experience a mid-afternoon slump. And this actually represents about 50% of the population. And their most productive time is in the mid-morning. Then there are the wolves. And this is what Michael Bruce is himself. And so here he's a sleep doctor and he talks about going to bed late. He talks about all these things that people probably think are horrible about sleep. But based on his chronotype, they make sense. So the wolves are the night owls. They go to sleep late and they wake up late. They have a hard time waking up in the morning. These are the people who wake up, but you don't want to talk to them for the first couple of hours. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They're more energized in the evenings. And this is, again, about 15 to 20 percent of the population. And they're most productive in the middle of the day and in the evening. And then the last category, he says, as a sleep doctor, is actually the most challenging group for him. These are the dolphins. And kind of interesting, he said he chose the word or chose the animal of a dolphin to represent them because dolphins actually sleep. I believe the word is called bilaterally. So one part of their brain is asleep while the other part of their brain is awake, Hmm. hunting or guarding or whatever it needs to be doing. So dolphins are the light sleepers. Tiny little noises can, can wake them up. They have difficulty following a regular sleep routine. And they often suffer from insomnia. They sometimes stay up very late, sometimes go to bed very early, same as rising. Frequent nighttime awakenings, so they wake up a lot during the evening or during the night. This is only about 10% of the population, and they tend to be most productive in the mid-morning to early afternoon. So he said the first thing would be helpful is to know what your chronotype is. And there is a quiz on his website that you can take. You go through answering some questions about your productivity and your energy and things to find out your chronotype. And I think you've talked a little bit about this before, Daisy. Do you remember what your chronotype is? I have. And when I realized you were going to be talking about this, I was desperately trying to remember. But as I suspected might happen when you went over the different chronotypes, I remembered and I'm a bear. I'm a bear also. <laughs> <laughs> we are both bears. <laughs> All right. So then he talks about the sleep cycle and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this and he didn't in either of these podcasts, but I think it's just interesting to know that different parts of our sleep cycle, we do different things during them. They have different purposes and that also helps determine when and how much sleep we need. Was it him who, and there was somebody, and I was trying to remember, who talked about the importance of getting, it was more about the number of sleep cycles, cycles you mm-hmm. got. Yep. And I think, I, well, I might be about to say something that yep. you're going to talk about. So I was shut yes. up. <laughs> so the first thing, once we fall asleep, we go into an early stage of sleep, which is just light sleep. And it's stage one and two, pretty brief. And then stage three and four is deep sleep. Then we go for a brief period of time back to the light sleep and then into REM sleep. And that is the rapid eye movement sleep. So as you just mentioned, the going through that whole pattern creates a sleep cycle. And that's generally about 90 minutes long. And the amount of sleep people should get is an average amount of sleep is five cycles. So that would mean seven and a half hours. But then he talked about at some point, he learned about himself in studying all of this, that his sleep cycle is a little bit shorter. It's actually about 83 minutes. And so he does well with six and a half hours of sleep, that that's really his optimal sleep. And then he talked about knowing when to go to sleep based on what is your kind of optimal wake time, and then subtract the seven and a half hours from that. So if you're someone who is best off to be awake at 7 a.m., then you're best to go to sleep by 11.30. And going through the chronotypes, I didn't mention this part. For example, the lions, their wake time is generally between 4 to 7 a.m. 
the bears, their wake time is usually just sometimes they rise and fall with the sun. So around sun up. The wolves wake time is between eight and 10 usually. And the dolphins, it's very irregular. So again, when you should go to bed is more based on what is your natural wake up and getting the seven and a half from there. So we talked then a little bit more about the stages of sleep and the importance of them. And a really important part of our sleep cycle is the deep sleep. And this would be stages three and four and makes up about 25% of our sleep. This is the part where it really helps us to wake up and feel great kind of sleep. He said this is when repair happens, our physical repair happens. So it's kind of like taking your car to the garage and they get all the dents and dings and paint scratches off it. They fix it up physically. During this time is when growth hormone happens. And growth hormone is a really important hormone for all of us in, again, repair and building our body. And so we definitely need this deep sleep part. It's a really important part. And then the REM sleep is our mental restoration period where we move information from short-term to longer-term memory, where we make sense of things. And we also dream most during this time because our brain uses stories to integrate that information. So it's kind of playing out these stories in our mind, which are the dreams. And interestingly, the body uses the most glucose in this stage of sleep. Mm, that's interesting. So it's a very active time. And then he talked at some point about brain activity levels and how people think your brain is very inactive during sleep. During REM sleep, actually, our brain is as active or more active than even in a wake period. So it's actually very active. And so again, kind of talking about the misnomer that most people have always thought we need at least eight hours of sleep, whereas technically it's more optimally seven and a half hours so again, when we sleep is equally as important as how much we sleep, and in some cases, even more so. So then he talks about strategies to help with sleep, just to improve our sleep. He also has a book that is called The Power of When, and this is to really help you know, based on your chronotype, when is it best for you to be intimate? When is it best for you to eat? When is it best for you to sleep? All of these big things in your day. So every now and then he hinted at things from the book, but he basically said, you'll have to get the book to learn more about that. But the rest of the, what I thought was useful in these two interviews is just some really helpful, easy things that we can work on to improve our sleep. So he said, every once in a while you have a day where you didn't get good sleep the night before or something, and your day is just really off and you're low energy. He advises taking what he calls a Napa latte. <laughs> Now, a Napa latte is a six ounce drip black coffee, no cream, no sugar. Put some ice cubes in it to cool it down and drink it as quickly as possible and then take a 25 minute nap immediately following. Hmm. Not longer though. So what happens is that this nap helps burn off that adenosine that has been accumulating. So re-energizes you with, and also the caffeine. And so he says he guarantees this gives you energy for four hours. However, this is not to be used every day. He said, if you're using a Napa latte every day, it's not going to be effective. You've got kind of a sleep crisis going on. This is for use in case of emergencies. Because you wouldn't have thought you'd be able to take the 25-minute nap after the espresso. Um, I think that's why you have to do it right away. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Because mm. of the timing of the, mm. the caffeine. And then the espresso sort of hits as you come out of mm -hmm. the nap. Interesting. So his main tips are, I'm going to highlight what I heard his main points were. And then he actually, again, describes the top five tips. But first thing is alcohol. If you consume alcohol, to be done three hours before bed. And this is particularly if you're having three or fewer drinks. But one alcoholic drink your body takes one hour to process. So you want to be done before going to bed. So alcohol three hours before if you consume alcohol. Coffee 90 minutes after you wake up. I was so surprised to hear this because, you know, so many of us are in the habit of having our coffee first thing in the morning. But technically, regardless of whether you're someone who generally gets up at 6 a.m. or 9 a.m., 
you should wait 90 minutes after you wake up to have coffee if you drink coffee. That's interesting. Why? <laughs> Does he say why? I don't think he said why. I think it's just part of the, the sleep. I can kind of see the logic. You kind of have to naturally, is there like a period of time that you should allow your body to naturally come out of sleep before you jolt it with caffeine? I wonder if it's something along those lines. It is, but I honestly, I don't think he described it in detail. Right. And that you should be done with caffeine by 2 p.m. Mm, remember that. Now, this was the interview he was doing with Michael Gervais. And he said, wait, wait, you know, Matthew Walker said this many hours. And so there's controversy about this. And he said his belief is that the half-life of caffeine is six to eight hours. So if you are done by 2 p.m., that is fine. And this guy said, yeah, but the quarter life goes on for 12. And he said, the thing is, though, for the majority of people, and again, this is the sleep doctor. So he said for the majority of people who are in that much of a sleep-deprived state, the exhaustion will override that very small amount or effect of caffeine at that point. So he said as long as you're done by 2 I would say if you're someone who knows you do well, if you finish by noon, then there's no reason to change that. Mm. Hydration. He focused on hydration being very important. Like first thing in the morning when you first wake up, rather than having that coffee, have like a 16, 20 ounce glass of water. Get yourself very hydrated. Physical activity is best way to improve your sleep quality. Um, sleep is recovery. And if you don't do activity during the day, you don't have as much to recover from. And so your sleep starts to suffer. It becomes lighter and less effective. On the other end of that, though, not to exercise too close to bedtime due to the fact that it raises the body temperature. And it's harder for us to go to sleep when our body temperature is up. Definitely. Mm. He advises thinking of going to sleep as a plane landing, coming in for a landing. And it takes an hour <laughs> to come into that landing strip. So he breaks it up into 20-minute segments. So the first 20 minutes would be doing the necessary things, getting things ready for the next day. He has kids, so like getting the kids ready, making sure things are ready for the next day of school, whatever. Next 20 minutes would be hygiene, brushing your teeth, doing all of those things. And then the next 20 minutes would be doing something like gratitude, meditation, or prayer. And... Um, he talked about blue light blockers. He talked about not getting blue light. And you and I have talked about that in previous episodes. So within 90 minutes of sleep, so wearing blue blocking glasses. And he talked about he's fine actually with people having TV before sleep because it's not as close to their face. But he says not media, like not the news, mm -hmm. but not a phone or a tablet because those are much closer to our face. So much more blue light effect. Um, talked about a cool temperature, 18 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. Um, again, our body has a harder time going to sleep when it's warm. Um, sunlight in the AM turns off the melatonin faucet. So when you wake up and you're groggy, go sit outside and get some sunlight with that glass of water. And then also this sunlight is what helps your body, the rays in the spectrum help your body make melatonin so that you'll have some for the next night. And then one of the most important things he emphasized many times in both of these episodes is to set the same wake time every day. And in one of them, he talked about, let's say, for example, Friday night, you stay up later. So you sleep in a half hour later on Saturday. You do it again on Sunday so you, or Saturday. So you sleep in again on Sunday. I think he said for every half hour of extra sleep in the morning like that, that we create... I can't remember the actual term he used, but it was something to the effect of like a antisocial hangover or something. Like we're actually setting ourselves back. Just the fact that by sleeping extra beyond our normal time, we're making ourselves more likely to have difficulty with our next sleep. And this is why a lot of people have a very hard time falling asleep on Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. Most people think it's because, you know, they're starting to get anxious about the work day. But a lot of it has to do with this sleeping over their amount of time. And then, of course, it's that extra struggle waking up on the Monday morning right. because you haven't had enough sleep. Right. And that's what he said. And then Monday sucks. And, mm. you know, it's just this cycle. 
So he also recommends magnesium. It's a great assisting thing for sleep. And his, he says this is his favorite recipe for it. I don't know that it's something I would do because I don't eat these, but it's banana tea. That basically you cut a banana in half and you put it in boiling water. <laughs> the, Make the, me peel, <laughs> the peel of a banana has, I don't even remember how many times, like three times the amount of magnesium and then the actual banana. So just drinking this kind of banana water, which his daughter says, dad, it has, it's so banana-y. <laughs> um, but this, this is a great natural way to get magnesium without taking a supplement. He also talked about guava leaf tea. This is something I'm going to do more research about because it helps with blood sugar stability. Hmm. And especially for people who wake up. And one of the, in the interview when he was talking with Michael Gervais, he says, oh, I always wake up around two o'clock. I'll go to sleep at this time, then I'll wake up at two. And he says, well, my guess is that's a blood sugar. When did you have dinner? And it was like eight hours from when he had had dinner. And he says, yeah, you're having a blood sugar crash at that point. And so your body wakes you to, to get that moving again. So guava leaf tea is something that can help um, keep your blood sugar stable to avoid that waking during the night. He also actually recommends a snack, but there are so many of us that don't eat before bed, you know, if we're doing intermittent fasting or um, some of the things he might recommend, like one of the greatest snacks right before bed is honey. Well, paleo or primal or ketogenic eater are not going to want to do honey before bed. So this is why he recommends guava leaf tea. Uh, so his five steps, when he boils it down to the five things, one wake up time that is consistent all week. Caffeine is done by two in the afternoon. Alcohol is done within three hours. You know, you've completed any alcohol consumption at least three hours before bed. Physical activity daily four hours before bed, not to do that closer to bedtime than four hours, and 15 minutes of sunlight in the morning. He then added some extra things that he thinks are important. He talks about a media diet, 90 minutes before bed, if you're going to be watching something or listening that it's not media focused. He said, you do not need to know about the COVID numbers before going to sleep. Mm. You don't need to know how many people were killed in the US that day right before you go to sleep. So, you know, if you want to watch a romantic comedy before bed, he said that's fine, but not a media viewing. He talks about progressive muscle relaxation as, as a very helpful tool with sleep. He talked about a gratitude list. And mm -hmm. Daisy, I just keep coming back to that early on episode. And he talks again about this is research-based. There's so much benefit to the gratitude list. And he talks about a hot bath or a shower 90 minutes before. And you don't want to do it closer to bedtime because, again, then your body temperature is warmer, mm, temperature which makes thing, it harder it? Yeah. to go to sleep. So it's a great thing to help you relax, but at 90 minutes before sleep. And then, again, he repeated the guava leaf tea. So those are some things that I think all of us could do, the real practically based things to do to improve our sleep. At some point, I'll finish listening to the three-hour interview with Matthew Walker. But I, I think these were great episodes, and I'm, I'm sure that others are as well. He's just, um, Michael Bruce is just very practical. He's humorous. And again, the one interview, which was much more about his life and how he got where he is professionally. And it's really a fascinating story and just a really you know my bias on this, but just like a really good guy, the way he talked about how he has navigated things in life. So I hope people can take some of these ideas and benefit from them. Yes, well, I have come across Michael Bruce before, and it's been a while, but yes, you've reminded me uh, of a lot of the things he talked about. It's definitely true about the, the temperature thing is big for me when it used to get really hot in France in the summer, that, that period of time where was just too hot at night I slept really really badly I'm one of these people who really likes it quite cold my dad always laughs when I go and stay with him I like to have the air conditioning <laughs> turned down so cold that I need a blanket on I I'm definitely somebody who prefers it a bit on the chillier side to sleep 
I wanted to ask you about something that you mentioned very near the beginning about adenosine and the using up of the calories and that impacting sleep. And it made me think about how that works with fasting. Is that one of the reasons why some people find it, I'm one of them, find it more difficult to sleep when they're fasting? Well, it's interesting that you asked that because I started thinking that while I was listening to, obviously, since my work is with people fasting. And to be clear, maybe to have this make sense for people listening, if, if they're not familiar with that, some people, when they fast for longer periods of time, like maybe 24 hours or more, they actually don't sleep as much. They're not as tired. And I don't know, but as I listened to this, it made sense to me that they're not accumulating the adenosine mm. to make them need feel as tired and go to sleep. But often what happens is people will describe, you know, they're frustrated that their sleep is off, but they're not actually more tired the next day mm. because the reality is they just didn't need mm. as much sleep. But I think it concerns people because we've been so now conditioned to think, I have to get my eight hours of sleep and I only got five and a half last night. And yet their energy level is good. So I assume that is related. I had not known that explanation before, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, it does. It's very interesting. And I can't remember whether he talks about this or whether it's Matthew Walker. But I'm trying to remember with this whole thing with the sleep cycles and you talked about the different stages of that and how important the deep sleep stage is and the REM sleep as well. I'm trying to remember who talked about it and how important it is to have a certain number of those blocks together. I have a feeling that they mentioned something about you need a couple of the sleep cycles before you actually start getting the proper deep sleep part of the sleep cycle. And that's why it's important to have a decent block of sleep and not to say split your number of sleep cycles into two parts for example mm -hmm. he did not talk about it in either of these and these are the main exposure i've had to him so far i haven't read his book and as i said i have not gone through the matthew walker work yet because i had also read in other places before that two sleeps is actually something that's common and for many of us something we did ancestrally. Mm. I find that I feel better when I get two sleeps, meaning I go to sleep for three or four hours. Then I wake up for a couple of hours and then I go back. I would assume either way that not interrupting the sleep cycles to do that, but to get, let's say, two full complete cycles and then be awake for a while and then get three more sleep cycles, I would assume would be important. Um, but I don't know which one of them talks about that or, or how they talk about that. He did not in these two interviews mention that. Yes, I can't remember. I'll have to go back and listen. But I remember um, there being something about that. And yes, and you've reminded me that was actually quite a typical way of sleeping, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. To have that broken part in the middle where people would get up in the middle of the night and actually go downstairs and have a cup of tea and talk to each other for mm -hmm. a bit and then go back to sleep. I find that over the past, I don't know, month, a few weeks or a month, my sleep quality has improved according to my aura ring. But if I go look at it, it doesn't yet make sense to me about the sleep cycles because I get a lot of my deep sleep. Although he did say that's the first 25% generally, or earlier, but I get almost all of my deep sleep early in the night. But on nights that I do two sleeps, I have deep sleep again when I fall back asleep. Mm, interesting. If that makes sense. Isn't there somebody also who talks about the importance actually of getting to sleep by, I think, maybe it's Matthew Walker, 11 o'clock is the sort of magic time that something about that you get that deep sleep earlier on. So I seem to remember thinking about it, it was in that period of time where I was in a really bad sleep pattern 
bad for me anyway and not getting to sleep until sort of three or four o'clock in the morning and then not being able to wake up until midday or something Mm -hmm. and somebody talking about actually it's not just about how much sleep you get Mm -hmm. and how many sleep cycles you get but it is actually important to go to sleep by a particular time to get that proper deep sleep. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a therapist, I used to talk about that all the time with clients. But if I try to think of kind of what he's saying now, maybe it's not that it's the same time for everyone. But I had once read that the eight hours of sleep between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. are different quality than midnight to 8 a.m. But if you really go with his discussion of chronotypes, a wolf would easily go to bed at midnight and sleep until eight, and that would be their optimal time. So I I don't know if that just varies. Again, I'm sure there are different theories and people have their ways to support their own theories. But the idea that those same number of hours at different times do different things for our bodies. Mm. I think it's Matthew Walker who talks about that there's not really much of a difference between early birds and night owls that actually when you get into it there's hardly any difference at all Mm. and but actually listening to Michael Bruce talk about it and he has these different chronotypes actually the difference is not huge it's Mm -hmm. not when we're talking um, night owl or his wolf he's still talking about people getting up between eight and ten not talking mm-hmm. about midday, two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's not mm-hmm. quite as extreme a difference, I think, as, as some people think about. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard him talking about this Napa latte thing. That <laughs> I found that very interesting. And funnily enough, what came to me after you were talking about it, you remember my epic drive back from France where... I actually used fasting to try and keep myself awake because I know that's a tendency I have. I really hadn't slept well for a couple of days before and was, I think, driving on I whatever it was. It was 48 hours or something, wasn't it, where I hadn't slept. But I actually did employ his tactic. Now you, when you were speaking about it, I remember I had um, a flask of coffee that a friend had made me when I stopped. If you remember, I had that massive Mm -hmm. panic because I'd lost Betsy's passport, but she gave me a flask of coffee and that's exactly what I would do. I would stop, I would drink some coffee and I would turn the timer on. I think it was 15 minutes. I had to get to the ferry port by a certain time and I knew how much time I had available for some sleeps, but I did need a few naps on the drive because I was doing it after no sleep. So I did actually use that Mm -hmm. technique and it worked fairly well. Awesome. But yes, I can attest to the fact that it's not something that you'd want to employ every day. No. And I think both listening to him and the beginnings of what I listened to with Matthew Walker just reminded me of, again of the actual detrimental effects of not getting appropriate sleep. And, you know, there are statistics that show this even with daylight savings time. When we lose an hour, the rates of heart attacks increases like 25%. Oh, yes, Matthew Walker talks about that. It's incredible. Mm. And then it improves at the other yeah. end of the spectrum when, when we gain an hour. And then Matthew Walker talked about, and again, I know this isn't about his talks, but he talks about the idea that you can actually go insane by going for too long without sleep. And I think he talked about an example of someone, it was eight days. Mm, And the hallucinations and it was just amazing. But the detrimental effects to our body for not getting appropriate sleep is amazing. What it controls in our body, how it sets the tone for every function in our body. Um, So like I said, I, I chose this because... I know the importance of sleep, but I haven't really gotten into learning more about it. So I wanted to start dabbling and learning a little bit more about sleep. And I think this was good, just some really basic things that we all can do. And of course, everyone loves a quiz. Absolutely. Finding out what chronotype they are. (laughs) And although I love dolphins, I didn't really want to end up a dolphin on this one. So I was almost glad I was a bear. 
Yeah, you and me both. (laughs) Well, that was very interesting. I hope you have a wonderful week filled with lots of wonderful sleep. You too, Daisy. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.